Um, can, before we get started, can you guys comment really quickly to make sure you can hear and see me? It's going to be, a, from what I understand, there's about a five uh, second delay. But if somebody could put a quick comment in there, if everything's a go with the systems check, that would be great. You know, I'll write it in the comment actually. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started then. Okay, so my name is Jill Canto. I am the founder of searchtinyhousevillages.com. And today we're gonna to be talking about the spectrum of available communities, the pros and cons of each type, Finding resources for finding a, excuse me, resources for finding a community or starting a community of your own and tools for working together. I'm going to be throwing a lot of links and information at you. If you miss anything, I'm going to be here for the comments afterwards. And you can always head over to my site, search tinyhousevillages.com to find all the resources you'll need. But first, I'd like to give you a little uh, backstory of my tiny journey. In 2012, I was a poor, newly divorced single mother of two children, a two year old and a first grader. I was buying groceries on credit cards and I sometimes had to choose between putting gas in my car or paying the minimum payment of the credit card. I was working seven days a week, telecommuting evenings, um, and I was up all day with a baby and that really resulted in only a few hours of sleep each night. My kids weren't getting the best version of me because I was, I was just really running myself ragged and juggling so many roles as a single mother. And my physical health started to spiral, which only compounded the problem. This continued for three more years until 2015 when my mom lent me $25,000 to build my own tiny house, which is what I'm sitting in right now. When most people consider going tiny, they take their time deciding what layouts would work best for them and how much they should, should downsize, um, how they want to build it. Um, but for exigent circumstances, I had three days to decide. I went online and I looked at a couple of floor plans and settled the one on one at tinyhousebuild.com. I bought the blueprints and the materials list and feverishly downloaded the materials list and priced it all out to see if I could get a feasible workable budget. So in July 2015, I pulled the trigger and began building my 28 foot tiny house. My previous experience building was limited to like playing my dad's workshop as a child. And as an adult, I hung drywall and laid laminate flooring, but that really was it. Um, I had a lot of familiarity with tools, but no skills to speak of. I certainly couldn't afford to pay someone to build the entire house, but I earmarked some of the budget to pay for a carpenter for the first three weeks while I acted as her assistant. And that kind of provided a crash course on carpentry and gave me more confidence on working on my own. Now for context, my tiny house is an open downstairs layout with a generously sized kitchen, a living area that doubles as a bedroom if needed. Um, there's an eight and a half by five and a half uh, foot bedroom, or bathroom, excuse me, with a vanity sink, compost toilet, and even a bathtub. I have two lofts. Uh, the smaller one is above the bathroom and I've got like a 10 foot by eight and a half foot loft above the seating area, what I'm sitting in right now. Now, most people would probably secure a place to live in a tiny house first and then buy or build a tiny house. But my situation was uncomfortable enough that I needed immediate change. And even though I didn't have everything figured out yet, I just had to roll with it. And because I was working and raising children alone, it took me 13 months to get it moving ready. And here I was 13 months in and I still didn't have a location nailed down. I went on Craigslist and Facebook. I asked my checkout clerks at the grocery store, my bank teller, the convenience store employees, and basically any stranger that would hold my gaze long enough for me to ask if I could live on their property in my tiny house uh, or if they knew anybody that would be up for that. And back then I kind of had to explain a lot what tiny houses were. I would even drive around my town and gather up the addresses of properties and farms that I liked and use the reverse address lookup to get their phone number and then kind of leave them creepy voicemails and ask them if I could live on their property. But surprising, it didn't pan out. <laughs> but until one day, I actually kind of did it. One day, I, um, a grocery store checkout clerk told me about a new website called nextdoor.com. And for those that aren't familiar with Nextdoor, it's similar to Facebook, but it automatically connects you to people that live near you instead of like sending friend requests. So I posted on um, nextdoor.com and that same exact day I found the perfect, perfect parking location for my needs. I'm on a six acre farm now and the owners live in a conventional home on the property. They have three children that are very similar in age to my children. There's horses and chickens and goats, oh my, and it's just an ideal setting. Um, and I really wanted to prevent others from having the same struggle that I had trying to find a property. So I decided to create a centralized list of tiny house communities and parking spaces. Um, I wanted it to be searchable using various filters so people could easily rule in or rule out communities based on their needs without having to do a lot of heavy research on each community. 
And with that, I launched searchtinyhousevillages.com, which is a 100% free website. Um, it contains about 260 tiny house communities right now and parking spots. And there's over 30 filters to help you dial in the perfect community quickly. Um, when I was building the site, I approached people that are part of the tiny house movement and I asked them what their most important criteria was for selecting a place to live in their tiny house. So I took their feedback for things like lot sizes and amenities, cost of living and location, and I added those as filters. But then I'd also like to talk about other filters I added, and not because I want to talk about my website anymore, but rather they, they're really good talking points and considerations for joining or starting a community. Um, one of the single most impactful filters is the decision-making model. Some options that you can have in a community could be majority vote, single leader, like a landlord, um, an, a homeowners association, and consensus. Um, let's put a pin in that though, because I'm gonna talk a lot more about that later. Another filter is culture. Some of the most cohesive communities have a common underlying theme, theme that unite the community members. Some examples are like eco-friendly, agricultural, secular, non-secular, diet-related, like vegetarian or vegan, or family-oriented. Uh, another filter um, asks about levels of interdependence. How much of your lives do you want to keep separate from the community and how much do you want to share with one another? And I will talk heavily about interdependence um, in, in a bit. Um, another filter asks what type of houses that um, that we might find that are allowed in that type of particular community. And that's just like tiny houses on wheels, tiny houses on foundations, school buses, which commonly we call to a schoolies, vans, container homes, yurts, park models, um, and conventional houses like single multifamily homes. Um, the last filter I want to talk about is the type of community. And the type of community that I live in right now is considered backyard parking. Other options that you'll you'll find are tiny house friendly RV parks and tiny house friendly mobile home parks. There's tiny only communities where they only allow tiny houses and mixed housing where there could be a mix of conventional and tiny houses permitted. Lastly, there's something called a tiny house, house hotel. And this is a community of short term rental houses and it's often mixed with the tiny house community as often as a, a form of revenue for the community. As an aside, I highly recommend anybody that hasn't built or bought a tiny house yet to um, go to a tiny house hotel and rent a few different tiny houses, try them on for size and see um, which ones meet your needs the most because you really need to maximize the space for living tiny. I, I wish that I had done that. I got really lucky because the model I, I selected was very versatile, but even so I could have made changes to the layout before a building to suit my needs better. I get asked a lot, what's the difference between an RV park and a tiny house community? And while I think there's a better question that we could ask instead, and that is what's the difference between a neighborhood and a community? We're all pretty familiar with the neighborhood, but why does a neighborhood get built? It's, it's typically because there's a developer or a group of developers that are trying to turn a profit. Um, the neighborhood's based on a business model, but when you look at a well-done community, such as like an intentional community, it's based on a people model. Of course, there's communities that fall in the spectrum somewhere between both the business model and the people model. So what exactly is an intentional community? It's a planned residential community designed from the start to have a high degree of social cohesion, co excuse me, social cohesion and teamwork. The members of an intentional community typically hold a common social, political, religious or spiritual vision. They typically share some responsibilities and resources, and it can include things like collective households, co-housing, co-living, eco-villages, housing cooperatives, and communities. New members of an intentional community are generally selected by the community's existing membership rather than by a real estate agent or a landowner. Okay, let's go back to the um, decision-making model and revisit that. In a typical neighborhood, you might have a homeowners association, but any of us who have lived in a homeowners, homeowners association governed neighborhood can often uh, attest that there's a lot of tension and the residents don't feel empowered. In an intentional community, you actually have a voice. Um, and when done well, the most successful decision making model I've experienced is called consensus. Now, when I first heard the concept of consensus, I thought, how in the world are 30 or 40 or 50 or however many people going to agree on the same thing every single time. It's not possible. But then I just learned I didn't know what consensus meant. So consensus, formal consensus, is a, it's, it's actually a structured process um, that entails creative ways to meet everybody's needs. You don't have to agree on the same thing, you just have to come up with a solution that works for everybody. There are modified versions of consensus that also work well, but let's take, take a moment to compare consensus to majority vote. We're very familiar with majority vote because our country is structured on it. 
I think we're all acutely aware of the tension and issues that can arise with majority vote, including the power struggles, but let's dive a little bit deeper. At any given time with majority vote, up to 49% of the people could be dissatisfied with the outcome of any given decision. And oftentimes there's only two or a few of, um, options to vote on, and those options typically don't fully resolve the issue. And if I'm trying to sway someone to vote one way or, the, uh, one way or another, I'm not listening to their needs. I'm just trying to ensure that, that, um, that they vote. So I'm not making sure their needs are met. Um, I'm just trying to sell them on my, my solution to them. In consensus, people feel like they're part of the solution. So they have more buy-in and adherence to the rules. They're empowered and they know that if something isn't working for them, then there's a successful process to rectify that. And believe it or not, formal consensus is an extremely efficient form of decision-making. The days of like passing a talking stick and meetings droning on for hours as everybody's expressing their opinion and concerns are long past. I personally feel it's the most efficient and productive meeting style available for communities. And also there's lots of tricks and tools to get an immediate pulse on how everybody feels on a particular subject. And if this were an in-person festival, I would be demonstrating some for you. At the end, I, I can show you a couple just really simple ones, um, but not some of the bigger ones. Um, let's go back to interdependence though. In a neighborhood, you may or may not interact with your neighbors, maybe like a potluck or occasionally watching someone's children so they can run an errand. But intentional communities have that higher degree of social cohesion. Um, this could look like having a community garden, regularly cooking food together, building each other's houses like a barn raising with the Amish, running a community-based community business. Uh, the more you rely on each other, the more community, community glue that you're actually building. And the more community glue that you build, the more you're invested you are in the outcomes of the people that you're sharing space with. In a neighborhood, your next door neighbor bought that lot because they liked it and they could afford it. And in an intentional community, the existing members are empowered to decide if somebody can join or not. That might sound extreme. I know it struck me a bit when I first learned that. But let's dive deeper into the logic before judging. The fellow community members tend to fall somewhere between uh, like immediate family and neighbors. They're kind of like an extended family. Um, and in the membership approval process, you're voting on whether you think the applicant will sink the ship or strengthen it. Do you really want this person in your extended family? You're not voting on them because you you know, you think they will or they won't be, be your, new, your new bestie or anything. You just want to ascertain that the person shares whatever common values are vital to the community, if they have the needed skill sets that would complement the community, and if there's any red flags that could cause major waves. Many successful communities have a well thought out membership process that can include uh, like a short stay for the applicant to meet the community members, learn the layout and the rhythm and the culture of the lifestyle. And then the next step is to come back for an extended stay, such as like 21 days within a six month period. And during that time, both the applicant and community, community members can really decide if the person is a good fit or not, and if the community is a good fit for the person. Now, if they do join, a brand new member doesn't yet have a full appreciation, excuse me, a full appreciation of the flow of the community yet, nor a complete sense of how formal consensus works usually. So they're typically made a provisional membership and not given, uh, excuse me, provisional member and not yet given full um, voting rights. Now, on to conflict resolution. A lot of communities, unfortunately, sink because of conflicts, which is especially tragic because they're largely preventable. In the U.S., we tend to run away from conflict. It's scary, it's uncomfortable, uncomfor and we don't want to get in the middle of things. Like, and instead, we just build taller fences, sometimes figuratively. I mean, literally, often figur figuratively. I can't say that, figuratively, too. But when handled properly, conflict can bring us closer together. If I have a conflict with you and I'm willing to talk it out, then I'm expressing to you my vulnerabilities, and then I'm open to hearing your side of the story, so I'm now empathizing with you. And once we've completed that process, we've built a, bit, a stronger bond between us. And conflict is inevitable, it's going to happen. So having conflict resolution policies in place are crucial. The first step is obviously prevention, such as fostering a, society, a societal norm that check-ins are a healthy, healthy, safe space to diffuse tension. One of my favorite types of check-ins is called a withhold. So you, have, you can tell somebody your grievance and then they have to wait 24 hours to get back to you. And that gives the recipient time to work past the egoic and emotional responses they might originally have and be able to hold a more thoughtful, rational discussion. How all well conflict is handled needs to be decided long before a conflict arises and not in the heat of the moment. Ideally, it should be structured as the community is forming. Of course, that policy can be adjusted as time goes on to hone to whatever is effective or not. Okay, let's hop back to interdependence. Now, in my mini community, my backyard parking community, I grow food. It's my happy place. I love growing food. Free therapy. And I've taught my host how to grow food, so now they've opened a produce stand. 
they have chickens and they gave me lots of free eggs. And now I have my own chickens and we share in the work of raising the chickens together. So it's less work. And at one point there was another house living on the property in their tiny house. And the woman loved to cook. Now I cook every day and I still suck at it. Um, but so she would cook frequently cook dinners and um, specifically for me or I would dine with them. And I asked how I could make her life easier because she was making mine much easier. So she wanted help with the website because she was struggling through it and pulling her hair out. And I can do that in my sleep. So cooking is a displeasure for me. Working for on a website is a displeasure for her. And with that small level of interdependence, both of our lives improved. Now, it's, it's no surprise that parenting's hard, whether you're a single parent or if you're in a nuclear family. It just takes so much time, energy, patience, and juggling. In my mini community, we co-parent. My kids just as often could be in the um, owner's house and her kids just as often be in mine. I treat her kids as my own and vice versa because we all trust each other and we feel comfortable enough to work through any issues that arise. And that makes my life so much easier. Um, my social needs are being met without even leaving the property. And while systemically problematic, loneliness is taking the front stage, front stage right now. I feel like social media is kind of like the methadone version of community. It, it kind of fills that void, but we still feel empty and you know, sometimes we resort to like retail therapy or alcohol or drugs or gambling or have anger issues. Um, that's kind of an aside. But so that's what my backyard parking experience looks like. I lowered my cost of living by 75 percent. I was working seven days a week to make ends meet. And now I can get by working between one and three days a week. I work more than that, but that's all I need to work. I lowered my carbon footprint drastically. My electric bill is oftentimes five dollars a month in the summer and maybe like 50 in the um height of winter. I increased my free time substantially enough to build a passion project website and I have way more time with my children. But I want to dial that interdependence up to 100% and see what that looks and feels like. And that brings me to Twin Oaks, which is an intentional community in Virginia. You can learn more about Twin Oaks at twinoakscommunity.org. That's twinoakscommunity.org. I need to preface that Twin Oaks does not currently accept tiny houses, but they do have a nearby sister community that does. Twin Oaks has been established for over 50 years and they keep meticulous records, which makes them great for case studies. Now, Twin Oaks is on 450 acres and it's home to roughly 90 adults and 15 kids. And they're able to maintain their lifestyle for about $7,000 per person per year. $7,000 per person per year. It's not an apples to apples comparison, but they live a roughly middle class lifestyle and they even get some perks, perks that middle class lifestyles don't afford, such as somebody cooking them two meals a day, doing all their grocery shopping, personal shopping, growing their food, maintaining their cars, um, caring for them when they're ill, building and maintaining their houses. Um, that's like Beyonce level type of stuff right there. But how is that possible on $7,000 per person per year? Well, they have a three pronged approach. One is income, domestic support, the second is domestic support, and the third is asset sharing. So members there have to work 42 hours a week, either generating income or supporting the community domestically. They allocate their hours that they can allocate their hours between any of the things that are on there, like the um, like the, with any of the on site businesses. They have seven on site businesses and they currently have one point five million in the bank as a community or they can um, allocate their work through doing the domestic like cooking, the uh, cooking and grocery shopping and personal shopping. Um, and. Uh, when I first heard the 42 hours, I, it kind of felt counterintuitive to me. And I was like, I want to live tiny in community to work less and have more free time. And this doesn't sound like it's going that route. But this is what I found. First, um, they decided that 42 hours was the level of commitment that they wanted to get the lifestyle and benefits that they have now. So your community can increase or decrease that level um, as it sees fit, um, fit for your needs. Secondly, they put in their 42 hours and the rest of the time is 100% theirs. And I know when I punch out, like I still have to pick up kids and grocery shop and cook dinner and do laundry. I feel like I'm dancing and clean um, and like bigger ticket items where I have to do house repairs or car repairs. And sometimes it feels like I have a second and a third work shift and all of those things are already handled for them. So, you know, they work 42 hours. So they actually have like 102 hours a week that are 100 percent free that don't have commitments to them. Do you? I know I don't have that. And I would really like that. Um, the third prong is their asset sharing. We're all familiar with book libraries, but Twin Oaks has a network of libraries, including one for tools, bikes, musical instruments, cars, and even clothes. You could certainly have your own clothes at Twin Oaks, but they do have a library if you ever want to um, expand your wardrobe. And that really brings up the question of access versus ownership. Do I need to own all the things in my life or do I just need access to them? A simple example is a lawnmower. It sits in your garage for the majority of the time, and then maybe once a week for 20 to 30 minutes, you use it during season. And you still had to pay the full cost of the lawnmower, 
and you have to do all the maintenance to the lawnmower. And just about every person in your neighborhood and, and street probably has their own lawnmower. The average household has 300,000 things in it. And when I first heard that number, I didn't even want to get out of bed because I know my job is the manager of 300,000 things. And I want to fire myself. I did fire myself. From that. Um, and th the library system at Twin Oaks serves a big part in having their 80% lower carbon footprint, 80% lower than the average American. This is where the meticular, meticulous records really come in handy because they even know how much their trash weighs. Their gas, electric, water, and waste, everything had about an 80% reduction across the board. So let's look at some other benefits that Twin Oaks members get. If you are physically, emotionally, or mentally unwell, your 42 hours are adjusted to your capabilities, even if that means they are suspended completely while you heal. The community will shoulder your load, just as you would do for another community member if they were ill. Now, I know personally when I was struggling as a single parent, that would have gone so far for me. Um, they also have the most progressive family leave and retirement plan I've come across. When a parent, when I, both parents have a child, their 42 hours are suspended for an entire year. And they don't just pick up the 42 hours again when, when the child turns um, one. They are slow, they slowly pick them back up and, until they're back up to 42 hours um, by the turn, time the ch child is 18. And to retire, they have this, and on the flip side, they slowly start losing hours. They also have on site hospice care. Fortunately, Twin Oaks is among a network of similar communities called the Federation of Egalitarian Communities, commonly referred to as the FEC. Find more about them at the thefec.org, thefec.org. There are many benefits in, if your community joins the FEC. The first is labor exchange. Starting a community is hard. It's like marrying 30 people and starting a business at the same time. Imagine being able to tap into free mentors to help your community hammer out your decision-making process, conflict resolution policies, various contracts and legal work, and having carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and other skilled workers to help you actually build out your community. With the labor exchange system, the other communities, uh, the other members in other communities get credit for their work hours at their home community by coming to help your community. Likewise, if a member within your community can, um, wants, they can visit other communities and get credit for their work hours there. This isn't just during the founding process either. You can do this at any time. It's kind of also a neat way to travel the U.S. inexpensively and kind of always just have kind of like a brother or sisterhood. Um, the second benefit is medical and dental, dental coverage. Your members become part of the FEC group plan. As an aside, the cost for the insurance is laughably low because people living in community tend to be a lot healthier because their needs are met, their stress levels are low, they don't have to juggle second and third shifts, and if they are ill, they're allowed the time to recover without having to worry about maintaining their life. A, th a third benefit is loans. The FEC offers loans for people that are trying to start or expand their community. Now, Twin Oaks is a really special place because every year on Labor Day weekend, they host the Communities Conference, and that's communitiesconference.org, communities conference.org. It's a weekend of workshops that teach you how to start or live successfully in a community. They cover a lot of the topics that I broached here, such as decision-making, conflict res res resolution, legal and financial decisions, and such, and such. Um, but perhaps are even more important than the workshops, which are really good workshops, is the Meet the Communities portion of the weekend. The conference is well attended by several dozens of communities across the United States and even other countries, and so they'll have one representative from each of the existing or forming communities stand up, in a long line and give a 60 second elevator um, pitch about their community, where it's located, their culture, whether or not they're accepting members. And then they will sit at a table for the next two hours. So you can speed date all of these different communities and see if they're a good fit for you, ask them any questions, get their contact information and even line up um, visits. And the entire weekend only costs hundred dollars and that includes meal, um, your meals. And they're, they're definitely not trying to turn a profit. They're just trying to share their knowledge and skills. Um, for those that are considering starting their own community, let me forewarn you, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. It's like marrying a business and um, it's like starting a business and marrying 30 people at the same time. Um, the Communities Conference and FEC are invaluable resources, but I want to show you another one. This is Creating Life Together by Diana Leaf Christian. That's Diana Leaf Christian. I hope that shows up. Um, I cannot recommend this book enough. I it should be read by each person on your founding team for your community. She also wrote a book for people that are looking for the um, picking the right community. So that could be helpful for you if that's the journey you're taking. Um, in closing, I want to say that tiny houses are not a new con concept at all. McMansions are all actually much newer practice and living with a small home now carries a stigma. But fortunately or unfortunately, we're in an area where that stigma is being lifted because we're just stretched so thin. And the folly of trying to keep up with the Joneses by having more flashy, more stuff, flashy cars, bigger houses, it just doesn't, we're finding it doesn't make us happier. So living tiny and in particular living tiny in community um, 
isn't just a fad, like it's our way of life. Our species has tribal roots in it. That's how we lived and thrived. We would have died without it. And biologically, our brains have adapted and grown to need community. We actually have deficits if we don't have adequate community support and connections. But the United States was born under the banner of interdependence. On a scale of cooperative versus competitive, we lean heavily towards the competitive sides of things. But cooperative communities can exist within our country's competitive framework. We have a lot of things that are ailing our society right now, and I'm not promising that intentional communities aren't insecure and secure to all of that, but they can heal a lot of what ails us, particularly if the community uses permaculture principles. Permaculture is a whole other talk, but if you're not familiar with permaculture or regenerative agriculture, I urge you to look into it. Uh, lastly, searchtinyhousevillages.com has been undergoing some really um, big changes behind the scenes, um, and it will soon become a really, it's already a great resource, but it's soon going to be kind of like a one-stop resource for all your tiny house needs, and it's going to be using a people-based cooperative model, and I recently opened that project up to partners um, and even investors, who, and I'd love to hear if anybody wants to come on board, board and join, help us join up so we can finish the 2.0 version launch, and if you're interested in that, shoot me a message at um, info at searchtinyhousevillages.com. And it looks like we've got three minutes left, but I would love to field any questions in that time. Um, I have not used this software yet, so I'm going to try to figure out. Oh, my God, there's a lot of stuff. What's the website? Uh, search tinyhousevillages.com. I'm not sure which website. Oh, yeah, that's what somebody wrote there. Um, Lindsay, if you're here, can you field some of the... I don't know why I'm yelling that. Like, <laughs> you would be able to hear me. Lindsay, can you field any of the um, questions? I see you in here. Oh my gosh, you guys did a lot of talking. Oh, somebody's a permaculturalist in New Jersey. That's fantastic. Do you live in a tiny house community? Are you trying to start one? Yeah, I did talk really fast because I was really worried I wasn't going to be able to get it in time. And I just came in under the skin of my teeth because there's two minutes left. I actually had to cut out some of the information because oh, thank you so much. Whoever put the Creating Life Together link on there. That's fantastic. Oh, I'm glad to hear this is exactly what you were looking for. Oh, ask people to grab the mic. Hmm. Can somebody grab the mic? Hey, Bobby. I passed it. <laughs> Can you hear me? Hello. Bobby. Hi, how are you? How great, are you? Good. Great, great, great presentation. I actually <laughs> built a tiny house now in Staten Island, New York. Um, ran into a few challenges, but I, I vision, you know, we'll take care of it soon. I appreciate the presentation. I took a lot of notes down. Um, and can you send your email so that, uh, I may be interested in perhaps investing that and I got to see what it looks like. Okay. But it's info really cool. at, sure. I can, I can type it on there. It's info at search tinyhousevillages.com. Okay, great. And I'll pass the mic so I don't hold up, take up the time. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thanks. And while I wait for another mic to come through, um, I'm, I just want to tell people, like, I'm trying to start my own community right now in Maryland, um, and I'm going through a lot of those same issues that, like, you guys will probably face, too, with zoning and everything, and oh, I did yeah. find a great spot down here where they're actually pretty excited about it, um, so uh, it's a 15-acre property um, right near, like, the waterfront, and there's, like, a 200-acre park with, like, tennis courts and football fields and soccer, and, and, and there's, like, um, the Y right across, like, two, two blocks away, and it's five blocks from the um, from the water, so... I'm very excited about that. Okay, somebody is requesting the mic. It was great talking to you, Bobby. Oh, uh, can you, I, I don't know how to pass it. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay, Mark, you got 33 seconds. <laughs> All right, hi. Um, I'm hi. wondering if you have any thoughts related to starting a community with family members as opposed to strangers or friends. 
Um, yeah, so I'm going to try to say, uh, re definitely have all your family members read the book for sure. Um, and just know that the people you start with might not be the people you end with. And that is totally normal and okay, because you're going to realize that your goals might not align. Um, and especially because your family, you really want to get those conflict resolution policies ironed out because you might think that that um, because your family that it, you're going to be easier with it, but that could completely blow up in your face. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's a great idea. And I think it'd be awesome if more people did that. Um, but definitely everybody should read the book for sure. Great. Thank you. Okay. I think I just, yeah, I just got in. The, oh, I, it's not kicking me out, is it? Oh, somebody else is requesting. So maybe we could just hang out for a while. All right. I do need to put my chickens away, but they'll be okay for a little bit. Hi. I just had to hello. go into this thing, but hello. Um, Hi. You were talking about that, that awesome place in Maryland. So where in Maryland are you, just out of curiosity? And no one tells exactly, but you know, the area. Yeah, no worries. Um, so I live I live near Baltimore now, but like in the kind of rural parts. Um, so not like not in Baltimore City. Um, but I will, um, the property is going to be on the Eastern Shore um, because um, like the Western Maryland and Eastern Shore are the easiest right now as far as zoning goes. Um, so this is mm -hmm. like the further you are away you are from a city, um, then the easier it typically is to get tiny houses legalized. That's not always true, but typically, cause there's usually, you know, less red tape and less people that have made more like rules and stuff there. So it's just a lot yeah. easier to go in, especially if they're economically depressed, um, then they're usually looking for solutions. And so, so that's, that's been my experience. Um, and I've, yeah. you know, I've talked to, go ahead. Oh, I live in West Virginia, so we were looking around this area. I'm only 81 corridor, so we're like an hour and hour and a half from Baltimore area. So okay, we were cool. looking, and there's really nothing here. So there's some RV parks that I'm trying to see if it's possible, but it's really kind of a desert. So it's frustrating. Yeah, it's like the west, and then some of the south um, are like are the most tiny house friendly right now. But like California is killing it, and, and Colorado is pretty great, fantastic too. Um, but it's it's slowly getting here. But it really takes conversations. I really recommend the um, the YouTube videos "Living Tiny Legally" Part One and Part Two by Tiny House Expedition, and they show how people the right way to approach community um, your local planning and building and zoning departments, um, so that you can start the conversations and successfully. Um, and uh, uh, Lindsay, you're on here, um, American Tiny. Uh, tiny, I'm going to butcher it, Tiny House Industri Industrial Association. Um, they put off some some really great webinars um, by Dan Fitzpatrick, who was the guy who got all of the, the places legalized in California. Um, and he gave a fantastic presentation um, that you can... Um, that gives you all the information. So if you become an, an it's called ASA for short. If you become a member of them, um, with them, I think you get access to those webinars for free. And I super recommend it. Okay. Well, the good thing I found out is that in this, the thing I found in, in this area, in the county, Berkeley County, uh, there is no restriction for tiny homes. So you could buy land and put a tiny home on it, but you have to buy land. And that's kind of another step, you know, so. Yeah, thank you. which isn't easy because you have to do all the utilities and stuff, and that can get very pricey. Exactly. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, Constance is coming on board. Yeah, Hi, so Constance. Sorry about the lighting. I mean, I look it's like okay. a... I look like a red Sith, um, <laughs> but I wondered for the community that you're starting, um, who is actually going to buy the land? Are you purchasing the land or like, how does yeah. that work? I'm purchasing the land and honestly, I'm moving my tiny house there and going to get settled and then, and then worry about the community prospect of it. Um, but I'd really like to do something that's maybe a little bit less than like the twin Oaks case that I went over, but you know, more than where my current living arrangement. So I think it'd be great if like the land was kind of like a condominium where you buy a share. And then, so, and then, so you, you get like a lot of benefits um, from living there and then you can sell your share when you leave or something along those lines. Um, so that there's either like a nonprofit owns the, um, um, the land or it's, or it's like a, a, um, a land trust, something, something of, of that sort. So it's, it's not like a power dynamic. So I have the most amazing landlord. Like I, could not she's like a disney version of a person like she's amazing <laughs> and even with that there's still this weird power imbalance where and it's not from her it's me it's just like yeah. it's like do you want to be completely honest with your boss or are you kind of always a little bit on eggshells so i want to remove that element and um, make sure that it's like a more egalitarian type of setup yeah so, so how so how can we keep up with your progress on your community are you 
Uh, do you have yeah, a blog or something? put it on Search Tiny House Villages as, um, as a community. Um, once once uh, I, I close on the property at the end of the month, I'm still doing my due diligence. There's a chance I might find something that says, no, I, I don't want to do this. Um, but I'm still doing my due diligence. Once I buy the property, I'll list it as a, a forming community on Search Tiny House Villages. And then I know, I'm sure I'll do blog posts um, showing where I am on things. And, um, you know, and we'll need a founding, you know, a founding bootstrap portion of the uh, people that are interested to start moving forward. As I said to the other person, that founding bootstrap group might not be the same when we're done as people, you know, decide whether or not where we're going, where everybody's going together isn't, you know, for everybody. And that's fine. That's, you know, that's, Part of it, and I've actually got a. To, if that guy's still listening, I've got um, a, a form on my website that you can use, and it's everybody fills it out, and it just kind of asks all the important questions on on what you're looking for in a community, and when you're done, it's a Google form, so then you can see how every all of your answers line up with the, all the other people, and that's in the blog section. So that might be helpful for your family um, to see if you guys are actually pretty well aligned on what you're looking for, and it's really good for starting discussions. Um, so sorry to hijack your question there. Oh, no, no. It's all very interesting information that I can use. So. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're quite welcome. You're quite welcome. Does anybody else have a question? How can we list on Search Tiny House Villages? You can go um, to the website and there is a um, link on there that says add your community. It's completely free. Um, and it's the, the process, a lot of us in Maryland just went wild. Yay, I don't know who you are, but please email me. I need to know more of my Maryland people. Um, uh, but uh, it's a little bit clunky. The second version, it's gonna be way streamlined, um, but you can add your community on there. There's a whole bunch of questions. Um, and um, and then you can always log back oh. in and make updates to it as time goes on. I recently made a change to it that the people that um, la most recently updated their community, they get listed first by default mm -hmm. on the sort thing. So I highly recommend that you keep it updated frequently so that it, it's um, seen the mo um, most often, like a first page result for Google search type of thing. Um, okay, let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, Nadine. Yes, here I am. Hi, Nadine. Hi. So we're, I'm in Australia, and probably like um, America, there is it's legally it is a caravan a tiny house on wheels so yeah. um i know there's a stigma about living in caravans like and i wanted you said you mentioned a stigma and i wanted to know more about like the differences if you think there's differences or do you feel still feel stigma living in a, a tiny house community um just yeah just to talk more about that whole stigma issue okay. let me make sure i'm understanding you correctly first is a caravan the same thing as an rv yeah Okay. Okay. Like so, uh, there. so you wanted to know if there's a stigma of living in an RV or if there's a stigma living tiny in general. Um, living tiny. Um, well, as opposed, like a tiny home on wheels, as opposed to an RV. Like, is there differences between the two? Do you think that? Well, that I mean, I think found like um, structurally, I think that there's definitely differences. So, an RV, it's a recreational vehicle, and it's meant to live in for, um, you know, like up to ten to fifteen years, and then like. It's shelf life really doesn't go that much longer unless you put a lot of effort into it. Um, and I know a lot of like RV parks, they won't let you live in an RV um, that's older than 10 years. Um, like, I don't know if it's like that in Australia, but it, it, that yeah. tends to be something um, here. Um, and so like, so there's those differences, but if it attain, obtains what you're looking for, um, like if you were trying to um, reduce, you know, reduce your carbon footprint, increase your financial freedom and all of that, and it works for you, I say, go for it. Yes. Um, if you, depending on who you ask those, some people will say, Ooh, that's not living tiny or Ooh, that's an RV. It's not like tiny houses are cute and fuzzy. So they've got that thing going for them. So the mainstream is more willing to accept them. For example, yeah. like school buses, a lot of people live in school buses here and schooly they're also, they're, referred to as schoolies um schoolies i think they're amazing but schoolies have a harder time finding parking because they don't have that cute factor that houses have and yeah. i think um but i think they they have slightly less stigma than rvs just because they're a little bit different um so yeah, yeah i think i think we're, there's still a stigma of living in rvs um but i think that it is lessening um and because i think people are just realizing especially now that like financial freedom is like it's in attainable housing is such an important topic right yeah. now and it's not guaranteed under any like anybody can be a few minutes away from losing their home or needing you know needing a different living yeah. situation so. it's it's the same over here the the housing is just increasingly unaffordable and this is the global thing so 
Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that cute factor. Like, you know, the neighbor would probably oppose a caravan or a motorhome, but like if they saw mm-hmm. someone building a cute little tiny house next door, they'd yeah. be like, oh, what's that? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Is, let's see if there's oh oh wait hold on i lived in a school we are cute you are super cute i'm not saying you're not cute please don't take it the wrong way i think they're adorable but i do think that schoolies can have a harder time finding parking because they don't have as cute of a uh, like as cute of that like when you're looking at a tiny house you're like oh and a lot of people do that with schoolies but because they don't it doesn't look like a house first it looks more like a bus to them first and and um, they have a harder time saying like, oh, well, you can park that there because um, they'll we'll think it's a vehicle. So there's just that stigma associated with it. Um, but I think they're adorable. I would love a schoolie. Um, let's see. Are you looking near Chestertown? I don't know where that is. If that's in Maryland, then I don't know where that is. Um, no, this is um, kind of near um, Salisbury area. It's not Salisbury, but it's down by there. Um, okay, so also so Eric Mersh or Aaron Mersh is talking about decluttering. So if that's of interest of you, I see we've got 100, 134. Although I didn't know there was, we've got 134 people in here um, right now. But I'll stay here and talk with you guys um, for for a while longer. But um, if you want to switch over to the other session, they're talking about decluttering. What are the big, biggest challenges of starting community? Well, I mean, I've tried to start a community before in Maryland, and here the biggest challenge was money. Um, the land price is, is exorbitantly high here. Um, the other challenge is uh, everybody trying to figure out what they want, because when you go to a community, it's kind of already got the themes defined for itself, like what are the, what's the culture, what, you know, what's the goal of everything, the mission statement of the community. And when you're with a group of people, you're kind of just trying to define that. And as the group kind of is the group is nebulous now, then that kind of definition keeps changing and it can get really frustrating. So at some point, you kind of just have to decide who's the core bootstrap um, group and just move forward. Um, and I think it's easier to smart start small with a few group, um, few people who have an aligned vision um, and build from there, like get, get the first steps going and then bring on people who feel aligned with that vision. Um, so you don't have like a group of 12 people that are like, well, I want to live in the city. Well, I want to live in, in you know, in um, an urban set or in, in a rural setting, you know. So start start small and then build your way up. Um, but yeah, it's, God, it's really hard. How far from Owings Mills, Maryland is your land? Um, I live not too far from Owings Mills, but the land is like an hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes from there, the one that I'm buying. Um, totally makes sense. You establish bylaws. Yes, absolutely. So, on my, one of the things I'm going to be adding to my, um, to the, adding to my site is like a document repository for all the communities that want to upload. They can upload those documents because you really need, like I said, the conflict resolution policies, the decision making policies. All this needs to be ironed out. Even as you're forming a community, you need to take a log of what your decisions were for the day so that you have something to go fall back on. Um, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork is really important because. Um, if I'm holding a conversation with you and I tell you something, I tell you something, you're going to hear something that's probably similar to that, but you're going to have your own interpretation of it. And we could have a mismatch of those ideas. So if you have something written down clearly on paper um, beforehand, then it's something you can always go back to that's unbiased. Um, so, but yeah, I would have like entrance clauses, um, contracts. What are you bringing into this community that's yours? And what are you allowing the community to become a communal asset? Like, I'm, if I move in and I've got a shed that I, I don't need the whole shed and I'm like, oh, I'll bring my shed. Um, it can be a community shed because I don't use it. That needs to be in the contract. And like and my exit contract needs to say, am I taking that shed with me before um, when I leave? So that way, when I leave the community, there isn't this upheaval of like, oh, well, that's our shed. Now you said we could have it as a community. And so there's set expectations. So I think that, that those are some important policies that need to be made, too. Um, Have you thought of buying an RV or mobile park and converting the units? Yes, I don't have the capital for it. Um, and I couldn't find any for sale um, in, um, between me and my ex-husband where we share children. 
But yeah, that's a that's actually a way that a lot of people take is um, buying a, an RV park because it's already zoned. You don't have to you don't have to do the work. Um, a lot of the heavy lifting for it. Fran, you'd like to speak to me with uh, how to help people buy land and get community at the same time. Fran, go ahead and send me an email at info at searchtinyhousevillages.com. Angela, the land is going to be in Dorchester County in Maryland, kind of by Salisbury. I don't understand the downsizing. Is the downsize? Yeah, the downsizing and decluttering is happening in a different link. Oh, Pat! Hi, Pat! Um, yeah, that's happening in a different link. I wish I could tell you how to get there, but I'm new to run the world software myself. Have you had to spend a lot of time preaching to the county for zoning? Okay, so thank you for the question, Ryan. Um, I when I typically talk to zoning departments, I talk to ones that I I, I grabbed the low hanging fruit. Like I went to in 2017, I went to Colorado and visited like the what I perceived to be probably the most tiny friendly um, counties there, and uh, and. They were pretty welcoming. Um, they like there was one um, place in particular in Warfano County, which is um, which has Wal Waltzenberg. I'm gonna butcher that in a while. Wal Waltzenberg, I think, which is the first like one of the first places where you could have a legal tiny house foundation in Colorado. Now, um, Warfano County is economically depressed. The land is still really affordable by Colorado standards. It's a thousand dollars a dry acre, um, and like they are ripe for a. a tiny house community there. I sat down with them for two hours and they just, every problem I threw at them, they were so happy to work with me on it and, uh, and, um, and come up with workarounds. And so they were fantastic. Um, I'm talking to Dor Dorchester County right now in Maryland for the community. And they've been pretty great. Um, fortunately in um, Maryland, all of, 20, uh, all of the 2018 IRC, um, the building codes have been adopted and it, they left it up to the um, towns and cities if they were going to adopt appendix two or not. And fortunately, um, that particular um, town has. Um, so they, you're allowed to have tiny houses on foundations there. And when I asked the building inspector um, if, uh, like, how they would treat a tiny house on wheels, and they said, well, the VIN, it has a VIN number, so we're only going to inspect the hookup to it. We're not going to actually go into, into the house. And planning and zoning um, was fine with it because they said we consider it a modular home, so it works for us. So, you know, they've been really great too. I think when you go to places like, you know, Baltimore or in bigger cities, you might have the problems, but that's changing. Like I said, there's big, big cities like Los Angeles, I think just uh, legalized it not too long ago, or they're on the cusp of doing that. Um, uh, Fresno legalized it a long time ago. Um, and, and I think um, I think San Francisco area is, is um, next on step for that. And I think San Diego is about to do it too. Um, and Baltimore, um, they just proposed putting a, uh, like a 22 unit tiny house community in the city. Um, so it, it's getting a lot easier. Um, and um, oh, I think I answered your question, San Mateo. Okay. Somebody, Carrie says, I presented with Dan Fitzpatrick to the town of Pacific, Pacifica, a tiny house community on remnant property. The board of supervisors all said, oh, we love tiny houses and eventually went nowhere. They just weren't ready at this time. Yeah, that happens too. Um, there's, it's definitely not. You know, it's definitely not always going to pan out. But you know, the more people that call them and talk to them about it, then um, then the more that they're they're aware of it and that they can act on it. Oh, Pat, here's I'm gonna put somebody posted the link to the next talk on there. I hope you found it. Anybody else have a question or want to grab the mic? Somebody says, we're doing similar to condominium in North Carolina and Vermont on 900 acres. Fran, please add your community to searchtinyhousevillages.com. So some, somebody else says, in West Virginia and built a tiny house. I'm in county, not city, no restrictions. I had an electric meter put in and hooked up the main house to septic. There are rules there. It goes according to number of bedrooms. Yeah, I was able to tap into main water line. Fantastic. 
Yeah, we definitely need more legal parking spots. Oh, by the way, I should have um, touched on this. I'm not living legally in my tiny house right now. I'm kind of not illegal, but um, you're welcome, Gary. I'm not illegal, but, um, but because this land can technically have like a mobile home on it, but tiny house doesn't fit mobile home standards. Um, but what I have found, I'm not proposing you do this. If there's any lawyers in the audience, I'm just telling you what I found um, is that if you're not visible from the road and the neighbors are all tiny house friendly or enthusiasts, um, then you're probably fine because it's um, there's you know any type of enforcement code enforcement issues are either they're just complaint based so if somebody complaining about you or somebody happened like somebody happened to just see it like you know um, but it's usually all complaint based so if you're tucked away then you're probably fine I've been living here for four and a half years um, something like that and I haven't had any issue and I'm very vocal like if you wanted to find my where I lived you could so nobody's complained about it yet. Who would be the best resources for how to lay out a community? Also, is compound post posting so that it's um, preferred now versus doing a uh, full septic? Okay, so um, if you guys know of the Lake Dallas Tiny House community, um, Terry Landtrip built that. He, that was the first urban community. Um, and he um, launched a tiny house community consultant um, company. And I don't know the name of it because it just launched. But if you look for Terry Landtrip and look um, look for um, under Tiny House Community Consultant, I'm sure it will come up. Or go to Lake Dallas or shoot him an email and he can help you out. He's a really nice guy um, and he, he's been very helpful for me. Who to find out about zoning in Maryland for Tiny House? Um, can you can you re refine that question a little bit and be a little bit more specific? Like, because um, so, or I mean, I can just keep talking about it anyway. But um, you need to find out like. For that particular piece of property, what, um, who's the like governing body of it? Because um, you know, when 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 you look at any particular property, there's like federal federal standards for, it, and then the state can put their standards on it, and then the county can put their standards on it, and then you know the municipality can put their standards on it. So there's a lot of layers to work through, and each each um. Each, uh, like a property five feet away can have completely different rules applied to it. But typically you need to go to the planning and zoning and, and ask them what's legal. The, the follow up question is where to find land to do tiny houses as an investment. Um, there's there's a few websites that will show you um, land for sale, like landishome.com is one. Um, and you can find um, properties that are tiny house friendly on that site. Somebody is requesting the mic. Okay, Chris is going to be joining us. Hey, thanks so much for taking my question. Sure, what's up? Um, this is a great talk on the different types of communities. Is it possible or what's it like to just go ahead and like buy your own property? Uh, like maybe a half acre, an acre? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm just doing a 15 acres with the plans of putting a community on it. So, I mean, you have to lay all of the utilities and such, but so I'm, I'm sure you're already aware of that. Um, or like if you're, if the community is willing to, to work with you on it, you could do holding tanks um, for, you know, water, um, which, and do solar. So that might make it easier. Um, it's definitely an option, but like whatever you pay for the land, I would, you know, set aside, depending on where you live, like 30, 40, 50,000, you know, whatever for utilities, because that's also going to, to really run yeah. out there. So that's one um, of the benefits is the community is it's kind of shared utilities. Yeah. Is what yeah, you're saying. The, yeah. You definitely share in the cost and share in the wealth too. So because some of the ones I see around uh, North Georgia and you know, Western North Carolina are they pack them in like sardines. And yes, yeah. I, <laughs> I like a little elbow room. Yeah, so that's like part of the reason that I that I do the talks and like have the blogs on website because I'm trying to um, illustrate that that we don't need to be using the RV model for communities because an RV it's yeah. a, for a temporary stay in most parks, um, uh, most and uh, most um, reasons, and even like mobile homes they tend to pack those in too. But like like I put on there layouts that I think are really conducive to um, to fostering that community glue, like having houses like in circles where you have a common space in the middle and like have these little pods of these of houses, you know, with like common spaces in the middle, so that you're really fostering areas where people can spend time together instead of just packing them in. So you just know the people that are like the nearest neighbors that are next to you. And yeah, that's really unfortunate. 
Yeah, and I uh, saw one really new, a new one in Western North Carolina um, that is like about an acre for every uh, tiny house. Yeah, which yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty good, but uh, you know. I think Georgia has um, ones that are an acre each as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sold out, <laughs> so I think it has two more spots that just opened up. But um, but it sold out pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for answering the question. You are quite welcome. Where do I find out if my state is allowed to build tiny houses? So if you go to American Tiny House Association, they have um, on there a, a reference <clears throat> that I don't know what's caught in my throat, um, a reference of all of the different um, states and let you know how each state has if they've adopted the 2018 IRC code or not and appendix Q So that would be my first step is to see if they've adopted that if they haven't adopted that Then you've got a much bigger uphill climb So what 2018 IRC does is it sets framework for a legal tiny house on foundation not on wheels but on foundation um, And so where I'm moving I put the if I just put the house on a foundation and um, Then they consider it to meet 2018 IRC. They're fine with it um, now the next thing that you need to do, like I said to the other person is you need to find out who is the governing body of the particular land that you're looking at. And it very frustratingly, it can, for five land that's five feet apart, it could be two different governing bodies. So <laughs> you definitely need to figure that out and then go to the planning and, and um, zoning and ask them and ask them what their rules are. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but, um, but it's, it bears, um, it's it mer it's merited to mention again um, that the living tiny legally part one and part two document docu series they're free on YouTube they're done by tiny house expedition and it shows how people um, approached their communities and successfully got tiny houses legal in places where it wasn't um, so if it's already um, legal in your in your town then um, you know you don't have to go through all that headache but it's really really helpful for people that are still having to navigate through that process. Where is that in North Carolina? Um, he's probably talking about Asheville. Asheville is like the hotspot for tiny house communities on the East Coast. If you go to my website, search tinyhousevillages.com, you are going to see um, just an absolute, <clears throat> um, like maybe 12 or 13 or, or something in in, tiny, in um, Asheville. Sorry. Are you planning on installing full septic or just doing gray water for your community? We are in the, like in the, in the actual city. It's a town, but they call themselves a city. Um, and so we have... Um, sewer and water hookups available there so because the, they come to the property we have to use those um but i'm going to put a meter on the sewer because i do great water and i i don't have to pay for the water that i'm uh, that i'm not sending back out chris says it's north of Asheville and cashiers um we'll try to find the link will i be converting my tiny house to a slab on concrete um no uh especially because it's near the water i'm not going to go that route but i don't feel like taking the wheels off either maybe i should i'm not sure if that's proper but i haven't taken my wheels off in four and a half years i just have supports on either side of the wheels and supports on the end so i'm going to do what's called concrete piers and what that is is you dig like two feet down and then um you you put uh you know those um you put down some you set concrete um to, to level and then you put the those just those concrete blocks that you get from home depot you put those up build those up to too wide and then alternate them and then um when you have that like a two or three feet tall you just pour concrete down the holes and then you put your tiny house on top of it and that's your foundation it's easy so in this particular town where where i'm looking to put um by the community uh to build a community they are in the gray area on the favorable side of that so they can if it's got a vin then they don't inspect it so i built my own house so that's really great um uh, and um and because they don't like it just needs to be on a foundation then all they have to do is put concrete blocks it's super easy okay so we just got a new one can we meet i think we're neighbors yes mandana <laughs> send me an email info at search tinyhousevillages.com Um, Chris just posted the link to the North Carolina one. It's called right, Whiteside Realty LLC dot com. Um, is the uh, that that's not the community. It's called Triple Creek. I'm gonna grab that one too and ask them to add it to oh, my directory. Okay. Um, 
Well, okay. Okay, guys. Um, I think questions are slowing down. So I thank you guys so much for your time. And there's still a lot of you guys in here. Uh, I thank you for your time. And uh, I'll, I think we've got like a meet the thing, um, meet or like a hangout thing coming up. So I'm going to run and go shut my coop and pick up my goose and put them in the coop. And then I'll be right back for the, um, for the meet the, like the lounge area that we're doing. Oh my gosh, there's so many more messages. Hold on. What do you suppose? You guys are welcome. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.